So we should probably start. Um, I, see, uh, I, I see people uh, gathering. Hi, I'm um, Edward Shandorovich. Uh, I, I may come as a surprise uh, for the people that are attending this session. I'm uh, uh, standing in for uh, Amol Sarva, the uh, CEO of Notel. I'm um, uh, co-founder and uh, chairman of Notel. We started uh, the company together and um, uh, we are uh, recording this session and we're uh, speaking today with uh, Rory Oldham, who is the Senior Director of uh, Analytic Consultancy at um, Experian. Uh, Rody, thank you for taking the time. Um, thank you. Thank you for uh, making yourself available. Uh, we, um, I'll just uh, jump into, uh, into the discussion that, um, uh, that we're going to have. Um, and uh, maybe we can talk about um, an update on the commercial market conditions and some uh, big picture economic trends. Uh, you, um, you have uh, almost 20 years of experience in uh, um, analytics and uh, database development. And prior to experience, you were with Citi for many years, uh, the consumer credit uh, department or consumer credit risk um, department. And um, for all of those uh, tuning in, maybe you can uh, tell us about the commercial data sciences uh, team uh, broadly, um, the team at Experian specifically, and uh, what type of data you typically look at and what type of data you typically publish. Sure. Well, Edward, I'm, I'm glad to be here too. It's a pleasure when people ask me about my team and about the work that we do. So I'm always excited to share a little bit about it. Uh, we think about uh, commercial data science as a, a piece of the larger picture in the U.S. economy. Uh, we have our consumer side at, uh, of the economy and we have the businesses that that cash flows into to create and support jobs and, and as well as provide um, sources of income uh, for consumers to spend within the market. So it builds on a cyclical uh, foundation. When we talk about the team that I, I work with and uh, within Experian, we're part of our global decision analytics uh, group. My team focuses mainly on uh, commercial data and our impact uh, to small, medium, and large businesses in the U.S., providing insights and data uh, to those types of uh, clients within industries. Uh, to help them work more efficiently and to pro provide them some way to evaluate uh, their potential clients uh, as they go forward to look for um, good risk and to be able to continue their growth strategies uh, as they move forward. One of the things that we also do, you know, as part of a data science team, so we consult and that's part of interacting uh, with uh, businesses at a level to talk about how they should go into markets, but we also do the data science piece as well. And some of the things that we'll talk about today are, are advancements in advanced methodologies, so in machine learning techniques that are really uh, allowing us to dig deeper, use a vast number of data sources and endpoints to bring into a single set of logic that we can really put um, some new and exciting uh, opportunities and expansion opportunities within markets to grow our small businesses. Now, we talk, uh, some of the things that we put together and we talk to, we, we of course produce white papers as to you and videos and blogs and, and we are able to participate, Edward, with you on uh, calls like this where we can share with the market some of the exciting work that you know, we're both doing and uh, provide some insights to clients. The other things that we do are training sessions, uh, sessions that we call SIP and Solve, sort of like this. Uh, we do it uh, in instances that you can get just on YouTube, uh, visiting the Experian YouTube site. And these little sessions are about 10 to 15 minutes long, and they teach you a little bit about credit, both commercial and consumer. They teach you uh, a little bit about how we're addressing market challenges uh, in just 15 minutes, and we drink a cup of coffee with you and, and hang out for a bit and uh, talk a little bit about um, what we do. Now, when you think about Experian 2, we are, are a large company uh, that is taking and aggregating data together from 
not only the small business perspective, but from a commercial or a consumer perspective. So we're blending together the two. So you have to think about guarantor information with that commercial set of data. That really gives you a deeper insight into how the consumers are uh, participating in the financial ecosystem and how that participation impacts the success or performance of the business. And bringing that together really helps us to find areas of opportunity um, where clients can really find uh, way, different ways to invest and, and grow. And it certainly helps in the way that we address markets together. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, uh, it looks like you, by, by combining these different data sources and looking at these different trends, you really uh, have a holistic picture of uh, what is happening in the economy and, um, and really what is happening in the world. Um, I, I'm all had a session with um, ADP um, a couple of months ago and um, uh, ADP of course uh, is one of the foremost authorities on labor and work data in the world and uh, uh, Experian is one of the largest consumer and uh, credit reporting companies. And I think that um, some of the statistics that uh, I know about Experian is that you, um, you not only uh, provide or credit scores to people as, uh, as most consumers uh, know you as a provider of credit scores or you, or you freeze some credit scores for people, um, but you, you actually aggregate data on a billion people and uh, uh, 235 million US consumers and more than 25 million US businesses. Uh, that's really a lot of data. I mean, I, there aren't many other companies that have as much data uh, about people. Well, maybe Facebook, uh, maybe, maybe Google, if you talk about uh, billion consumers. Um, what, are the, uh, what, are the, some of the, what are some of the trends, maybe some of the not obvious trends that uh, you have seen uh, from the emerge from this data uh, in the last several months? Well, Edward, you definitely keyed off of it there. Um, we do bring together a large sets of data um, that are very diverse. We bring together traditional and non-traditional, what some folks would call alternative data. We bring all that together into a package. And you mentioned Google. You know, we partner with um, a lot of social media type um, contributors, uh, as well as our, our standard set of data furnishers, as well as creating endpoints for all different types of hazard data, geolocation data, mapping data that brings it really all together. We have rental and consumer data, healthcare data. I mean, it's, it is a vast and very, very, for a big variety of different data that we can bring together uh, to provide insights. And I'd say some of the things that really stick out to me uh, during this process of uh, uh, over the past few months, some of the things that the types of data that have really stuck out, we've brought together into a COVID risk index, and, and you'll see a couple of those out there in the market, but the one that we have at Experian, you can actually go out, touch and feel yourself just on the Experian website. And uh, it, it's really an interesting uh, concoction of data that we bring together. Uh, we bring together geolocation data, uh, macroeconomic data, our commercial credit data. We bring together uh, just uh, industry level data, and we look at the, how businesses are being impacted by COVID spread in the U.S. And as it has progressed, you know, when we got into February of this year, it started to spread. We looked quickly at how that's going to impact different industries because you know it will. If you put track, it's certainly done that. Now, bringing this together into this index, it's given us insight to say we can get out in front and identify uh, areas where businesses are going to close faster, where we're going to see unemployment uh, begin to spike, where we have about a two plus week uh, leading indicator in this type of data for unemployment numbers. So as we move forward, we really see some of those scenario signals uh, bloom. And we've talked to our some of our advisory councils too, very interested in this type of information as we go to market that is different than our core data. So you, people have looked at core data before. This really gives an opportunity to expand out of that. And so as we look at um, bringing other 
types of data together. I'll tell you about a few others. And, you know, Edward, jump in here if you have some questions. But we, when we look at consumer data, one of the things that sticks out to us is rental payment behavior, some of the mortgage forbearance that we've seen in the market. When we look at consumer markets, they've been pretty steady. Our delinquencies really haven't gone up very much. Um, and that's because of some of these forbearance and modification programs that are in place. Those are about to run out when we get into November and December. And we're going to have those payments that have been pushed from the summer to now um, really hitting uh, our consumers and where those debts aren't forgiven, they're just held into this point. So through some managed payment plans, consumers will pick that up, but that's going to add some additional stress uh, on top of, you know, unemployment leveling out at this point that we see. And so consumers spend, you know, if you've, if you've watched a little bit of the news, you'll see that spend is up a little bit, yeah. but it's still being held back by consumers. And yeah. so they're doing that, you know, the, the, the thought there is that they're waiting to see what's going to happen following this upcoming election. There's a little instability in consumer expectation and, of employment, and so they're holding back on spend a bit. Yeah. But are you seeing any, any interesting spends, uh, any, any interesting spend uh, details on, on the food side, for example? Um, I mean, people, you, you mentioned uh, rent and forbearances, but um, uh, that's one of the largest areas of spend. Uh, food, probably uh, the second largest area of spend. Um, we know that a lot of spending has moved online and we can see that from, uh, uh, from Amazon and the other stocks and then the results that they have shown uh, in the last few quarters. Um, we know that food delivery companies have uh, skyrocketed and um, we're seeing um, amazing performance from, uh, uh, from them and from um, the companies that deliver prepackaged food. Uh, so uh, are you seeing in, in the last few months as, as lockdowns have eased somewhere, um, is uh, restaurant usage evident? It has, it, has, it become, um, has it become a larger part of the consumer spend? Um, is it oh, it sure has. Yeah. You're right on, Edward. When we look at, at the market and we look at the recovery metrics that are out there, you know, we were expecting, you know, everybody was excited to see a V-shaped recovery here, and we're seeing more of a check mark. Uh, mm -hmm. We saw some of that spend in restaurants and sit-down restaurants pick back up um, pretty quick, which gave us the indication that we would see more of a V-style recovery. But that's flattened out a bit, and we, quite, we haven't quite gotten back to our uh, pre-COVID um, levels in, those type, in the foot traffic in those types of industries. And it's really been leveling out over the past two to three months. And that's because we're seeing another round of COVID spread in the U.S., and we're seeing some of the areas that were opening up to between 50 and 75% um, capacity being pulled back down to around 25%. Mm -hmm. So we'll see that, you know, cash flows will level out a bit and the spend in those um, types of businesses will probably slow a bit more here through the end of the year. Yeah. Um, another area uh, that's, um, uh, that's certainly a large area of consumer spending is, uh, um, is the whole car industry and uh, mm -hmm. Uh, both, both um, rentals and purchases. Um, are you seeing any interesting data there? Um, just anecdotally, um, in the first few weeks of COVID, uh, or in the first few months of COVID, uh, car sales have uh, uh, gone down significantly. And then um, there was a significant uptick as people um, started purchasing cars uh, and slow down their usage of public transportation. Uh, is that a trend sure. continuing? I think we'll see that trend continue into the first quarter of FY21 or into our 2021 uh, year. And that's because we're, we've, we see some of this is due to some pent up demand uh, in the auto industry or in the auto sales as we came through uh, the pandemic time uh, period where we had some closures in the market. Um, but our expectation is we'll see that pick back up, but it'll level off a bit and, and you know, the velocity of that will probably slow uh, as we get into the, 
first quarter. And it, it will really depend on stimulus coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, from Washington, if I mean, we're we're probably not going to see that uh, in the next two months coming out of Washington. I know the debate is ongoing. The expectation is that we'll probably see that in the first quarter. Um, so we may see that pick up a little bit. Um, and as that stimulus comes out and we see some more stability uh, in the future of business, um, we should see that continue to uh, rise into uh, 2021 which will get us back to that normal level. Mm -hmm. do, you, do, you th do you think, or do you, do you have any insights into whether uh, automobile sales this year uh, will be uh, higher or lower than last year? Um, it, it, at this point, I won't be able to say. I would say we're on a tra trajectory to have that increased volume through. And, you know, as you've seen some of our largest uh, automakers are picking back up. Mm -hmm. If we see another slowdown or if we see closures in manufacturing like we did um, in the late part of the summer uh, and distribution centers, then we may see again another slowdown in auto sales through the end of the year. It, mm -hmm. It's a little tentative now on, on where we'll go uh, dependent on this uh, third wave of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So, um we, we are, of course. Uh, uh, thank you for the. Thank you for this. And uh, um, these are questions that uh, I was interested in. I'm, I'm sure there are others that that have uh, uh, other types of questions. The, the main consumers of the information that your group provides um, are different lenders. It's uh, it runs the gamut from small uh, U.S. lenders to largest international banks and uh, different government agencies. What are you hearing from these, uh, spe specifically mega banks? What are the uh, what are the questions that they're asking? What impacts uh, of the pandemic or the commercial real estate market um, uh, are of interest to them? What 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 type of data and insights are they soliciting from your team um, as they as they work towards the recovery? Well, PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, has been their big focus the past couple months. And even now, and the forgiveness of those for small business, small medium businesses, is still a high priority, a lot of volume there. Um, so they've really uh, been focused on that. Now, coming into the pandemic, they were um, highly capitalized, so it kept some of that uh, volatility from impacting them too much. Margins are shrunk you know, from some of our largest uh, clients because of interest rates being so low. What our clients are looking at now are trying to identify, you know, it's Halloween, so Edward, I can say they're looking for zombie businesses out there, those mm -hmm. that weren't too good at the beginning of the pandemic. Now that the stimulus has run out, they're dropping off or they're closing. So they're looking for those that are closing that may have um, – that may have not been so good at the very beginning, but have held themselves up and kept this cash injection to keep alive. Now, we're still looking at medium and large size businesses, you know, when they're looking at lending into these, um, they're looking at the balance sheets, what's there, um, they're, they're following them very closely. Um, you know, biz, large and medium businesses are looking at cost reductions. And, and so that's uh, something that they're, you know, as we're going forward, you really want to see those margins increase. And, you know, in the U.S., that's a big deal. You always want to see the margins increase. And so as we go forward, that's been a big focus of, of our clients as they're looking at what's, what's going to survive, what is resilient going into the next few months. And they're looking, again, at opportunities to identify data elements from us that would be, again, they can look at their traditional data elements, but bringing in the non-traditional, even some point in time data elements, and we talk about API information that is not, um, that may not have that historical view. They're looking at some of this new point in time information and are more open to it to be able to get some directional insights on where they should be going uh, as, they, as they look into the future for some of these businesses that they're evaluating. I mean, there's industries that are going to have a hard time when we talk about where we're going to look. Um, you know, the airline industry is having problems getting people in seats. Yeah. Um, we're going to have, um, you know, all the supported um, businesses that are around that. So your venues and your hotels 
are going to be challenged with business travelers not being there. Um, even venues as COVID-19 picks up and we talk about, you know, that, that vacancy in commercial real estate. I mean, a lot of those um, venues, even in, when we look at Vegas, you think there's always a ton of people there. But as COVID-19 picked, you know, I live in Dallas. Some of the uh, events that were in Vegas came to Dallas so that it could be a little bit more spread out. So, mm-hmm. And, you know, there are differences in regulations there. So as our clients are evaluating some of the geolocation data that we talked about before, understanding state and local regulations, how that's impacting small business is really where our clients are trying to find directional insights to make some decisions into the next couple months. Yeah, well, since you started talking about industries that have been uh, hard hit, um, airlines are, uh, airline industry and both manufacturers um, and, uh, and the operators of, uh, of airplanes uh, have been affected as, as have been the airports, obviously. Uh, but um, as you know, Notel is in the, uh, at least Notel touches the commercial real estate market. Uh, so for those who have joined us, I, I have to ask questions about that uh, market and, and the commercial market, uh, commercial real estate market conditions have been materially influenced. Um, most companies or many companies are uh, still work, working from home, uh, certainly in the US, uh, certainly in New York and San Francisco where uh, Nutel's presence is uh, significant. Uh, some have started a phased approach uh, to be back in the office. Some have um, some have decided not to be back until sometime in 2021. Um, we uh, we're constantly checking New York and San Francisco occupancy numbers, and uh, they are hovering around 10 percent. And uh, that's uh, that's really anecdotal evidence. I mean, there are many more there are more companies that are. Uh, in the uh, in their offices, and many more companies are paying for space uh, than ten percent. But ten uh, percent is generally the number of uh, people uh, that are from these companies uh, going to work, which means that uh, the local businesses are getting ninety percent less lunch business, or ninety percent ninety percent less um, attendance for business in the convenience stores that are around. Um, so. It, it trickles down to, uh, to, the, to, to the local markets. And if you walk in a city like, I haven't been to San Francisco, but uh, certainly uh, parts of New York uh, have, uh, have changed just from the visual perspective. Uh, you see fewer people uh, coming to work and fewer businesses open. And uh, some of those businesses may not, uh, may not even reopen. Um, at the same time, uh, we um, we are looking at different statistics uh, related to uh, to return to work uh, or return to the office. And um, uh, recently, I, I ran into a statistic from Gensler, which is a workplace consultancy company, which said that twelve uh, percent of people uh, want to work from home all the time. Forty uh, percent of people prefer to work from the office, and the remaining want to be in some form of hybrid. So we see that people want to be back in the office, that uh, they realize that uh, working from home is not optimal. Uh, right now in, uh, in Europe, uh, there was a Morgan Stanley study, which I uh, read recently, said that um, 77 to 79% of Europeans are already back in, um, in offices. And uh, UK is lagging, uh, with UK it's, uh, it's hovering around 50%. But uh, that's a significant number of people that are in office. Um, and uh, uh, I wanted to ask uh, whether you have any uh, sector specific data or any consumer insights that uh, may shed, shed some light on this uh, broader US uh, return to work or return to office movement. Well, sort of, I would say uh, so, certainly yeah. Edward, from the folks that we have here, even in our office as Experian, you know, there, there are a lot of folks with kids and are ready to uh, not have their kids run behind them on screen and uh, have one of those moments. So uh, it's, it's pretty normal now to have that happen. And so 
folks want to get back into the office, not only because of that, um, some of the other things that are out there, you know, we have tools that are really expanding that are pretty good from a virtual sense. And so when you're looking at some of those higher numbers that want to work from home or want to have a flexible schedule, those tools are really there that are expanded. And we have a, a large list like Skype or Slack or Microsoft Teams. I mean, there's a, a litany of different products that you can use to have this visual virtual interaction. What, what we're finding is that um, companies are challenged with that in-person one-on-one kind of feel and the on and off uh, sidebar conversation and really where business moves. And innovation really, uh, that spark is able to be built into something uh, more substantive. And so when we even look at the way that we're interacting with our vendors uh, in, in a way to have and host uh, clients or vendors at a site, it's, it is uh, important to have that opportunity to get in and have those types of discussions to really cultivate that transformational vision that you want to get in this type of, you know, in, in an environment where you can really create something new. And I know, you know, Edward, as part of the businesses that you've been involved in here, that's really the that innovative entrepreneurial spark is, is something that's very important uh, in being able to grow and develop. And so as we look at folks trying to get back in, you know, we started with businesses that were uh, manufacturing, those that really had to be on site um, and hands-on uh, in building um, products. Those were the first ones to go back um, that didn't have an opportunity, those in the service industry um, we saw a lot of interest from scientific and technolo technological companies that were looking for those PPP loans to keep people included but work from home. Um, you know, again, that innovation, being able to get back into an office is, is important to those folks too. But they, they found that they can do some of the work virtually, so those flexible schedules and, you know, really the need for not so many sites have really come into play. So from some of our clients and, and, and even, even some of the way that we evaluate cost, it's looking at some of these additional sites where we could have folks work from home on a more permanent basis. But it is still important to have a, uh, a meeting site, a place where we can come together, where we can host our clients and vendors, and, and have a way to still have those face-to-face -face interactions in a, a place that is conducive to really that innovation spark. Yeah, of course, we, we, we all long for the serendipity uh, of connections uh, that uh, we find in, in the workplace. And um, uh, I think that for any, um, specifically for any services organization, certainly any professional services organization, which, um, uh, which includes a mentorship component and uh, uh, a significant recruitment and retention component uh, for the employees uh, that uh, the, the being in a physical proximity between the mentor and mentee is, is uh, of paramount importance. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's one of the reasons why we're seeing uh, large companies like Citigroup and uh, JP Morgan uh, mandating their employees to be back at work. We're in New York, we're seeing uh, the large real estate companies like the Blackstones and Brookfields of the world um, and large owners like RxR and related being back in offices. And uh, that's, um, uh, they, are, they are certainly setting an example for others, um, but uh, some, have, uh, some, some are asking their employees to be back half time or one, once a week, twice a week. Uh, are you seeing um, any impacts or what actually, I mean, I'm sure you are, but what are some of the impacts that you're seeing to the credit markets uh, that are um, stemming from these, uh, uh, from, from lower occupancy and uh, maybe lingering vacancy rates as, uh, as companies uh, are in the office only once or well, only a day or two days a week? Well, Edward, you really hit on it earlier, and I think from our from the perspective of um, you know businesses, it's balancing out that health with that um, ability to get together for face to face interaction. And so, getting back into the office, we would love to get back into the office, but we have to balance um, the way that our employees see. You know, about 
uh, a month ago, there, there was a study done, I think, by the census that looked at those that were ready to go back to work, and only about 72 percent, uh, or uh, only about 25 uh, to 27 percent of folks were comfortable getting back into the office. So even though these companies are requiring them to come back, they're still very tentative about being in that close proximity uh, with other folks. And so that can cause some challenges. So doing it safely and responsibly is certainly where we want to go as we go forward. It's going to impact, like you mentioned, some of these uh, support industries, restaurants that are around um, these uh, facilities, large um, complexes where folks are coming in to work together. So eating out for lunch, driving in, gas stations, um, any type of support industry, service industry that goes into, you know, even providing cleaning services within the buildings. So those are all impacted by having folks back in. That vacancy isn't there. The longer term that goes, the more that it will go to a flexible type of a schedule, even for services, um, where the you know, the agreements that they have with their internal vendors, either to provide food service within the building or to, you know, open it up to external um, businesses that are around to support the employees. It's just going to change. It may be more flexible in those agreements, even within building services. So as, as we kind of look at it and I think about some of the extension there, I mean, it, it goes, the longer we're out, the more folks are going to be um, less reliant on travel. So if you're not at your office in no tell and I'm trying to come and see you, I'm not going to fly to see you or drive to see you mm -hmm. because there isn't a place for us to meet. So getting that back in, you know, when we think about oil and gas industry and how this is impacting them with lower margins, certainly impacting how um, our country is looking at renewable versus um, fossil fuel uh, energy generation within the U.S. And, and it will be impacted depending on how long we have, uh, you know, this third or fourth or fifth wave across the U.S. So vacancy is getting people back to work and back into these centers is certainly going to help these micro uh, systems, biomes around MSAs where businesses are really bringing employees back. Yeah, I, I think I definitely think that. Uh... We will need to adjust, and uh, you're, you you just mentioned this uh, the second or third or fourth wave. I I, I think that um, we have entered the age of pandemics, and uh, maybe uh, this is not the first one. Maybe the, the first SARS uh, pandemic that uh, that really hit Asia hard uh, was a more was could have been the first one. Uh, maybe there was something else, but the SARS, MERS, uh, these. Uh, uh, these diseases uh, have made um, Asia certainly a little more prepared, and that's why we're seeing some uh, some of economic some, some better recovery in Asia. Um, they were um, maybe physically better prepared, better prepared uh, health systems. Uh, people were mentally more prepared for um, handling the pandemic and uh, and its repercussions. Certainly, wearing masks. We we saw people wearing masks. Uh, in Hong Kong and uh, in broader China, years before COVID, um, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it. But in in the U.S., it has been um, a really rough stretch for uh, many businesses, especially small businesses, which um, are uh, the backbone of our economy. And uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, forbearances and moratoriums on uh, um, on debt, both consumer and commercial, are soon coming to an end. You said uh, November and December of this year. So right. uh, that, will, that will compound uh, uh, the pressure, cash flow pressure and uh, just and p and pressure that, uh, that the small businesses are, are seeing. They're already struggling and, and it, it just may get worse. Uh, we were simply not prepared for this. And I, I, I think I read a statistic that um, uh, Yelp is predicting that about up to 60% of uh, temporary business closures may turn out to be permanent closures. Uh, right. That's um, uh, that's staggering um, or sobering. Uh, what is your outlook um, for the small and mid-sized businesses for the next six to 12 months? Um, is there a light at the end of the tunnel? Uh, 
can we can we look forward to something what is the what, what is the optimistic uh, is there any data that you're seeing that uh, that suggests uh, an optimistic outlook sure uh, uh, you know as we look at how we're progressing even through the summer uh, with our check mark shape recovery that we're in right now uh, an extension of that you know future looking edge of the recovery um, some of the 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 highlights are really that the stimulus package has worked to get us along this far. Uh, it has um, stemmed some of the delinquencies that would have caused banks to, to get into a little bit more trouble. We have another stimulus package that has uh, very good potential to hit us in the first quarter, which is going to help to stabilize out even more. Banks are um, pulling back on their capitalization to, that they've really adjusted for to accommodate for losses that were that they really expected at the end of the summer. And they're pulling back on that and reinvesting um, some of that capital, looking at a future that uh, is more stable. So I think that, you know, looking at that delinquency rate not getting out of control, consumers and small business, because the delinquency rates haven't gotten out of control, they've used their stimulus to pay some down some of the debt, and they've been very thoughtful in general uh, to stay on track in their payments. What we'll see is that there will be some wave of debt that will hit at the end of the year as moratoriums and forbearance uh, come to pass. Even electrical, you know, we talk about energy and communications moratoriums that there as well that are going to end at the end of the year. It will create some additional debt loan on the businesses, but they're going to have, you know, through this uh, ability to maintain very reasonable credit and credit has not dropped off the edge for either consumer or commercial uh, entities. What that'll mean is that affordable funding will still be there. And another good trend that we're seeing is within our lenders into these segments, both consumer and commercial, is that they had and we're prepared for a recession in their strategies. And so as soon as we hit March and April, they flipped the switch on their recession plans, put those into place. It kept the capitalization good and it allowed them to continue to lend. As, they, as we get into this time now, they begin to loosen up that credit criteria uh, to provide funding to small business and consumers and large businesses. They're capitalized well so they can do that. Um, that leads us to believe that we're going to have, you know, in into the uh, middle to end of 2021, uh, we should be back to about where we were uh, in uh, March and April. And that's, of course, an optimistic scenario, but it's one that um, certainly could happen as we go forward and we look for one additional stimulus and some um, good economic headwinds, uh, hopefully as we see COVID kind of calm, as we see some vaccines come into the market and we see some additional types of treatments come in that could keep that spread lower. So we're certainly tracking that as we go forward. Well, I mean, we're certainly all hoping for economic tailwinds. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, we, we are, we have another uh, five minutes to go and I thought that um, I would raise uh, a completely different topic which is uh, uh, just as important um, as the economy um, and uh, consumer spending, uh, because it has it, it it does deal with uh, our society. Um, we um, uh, I, I saw in the news a couple of weeks ago, uh, Experian hired its uh, first chief diversity officer. I think it's the the correct title is first chief diversity inclusion and belonging officer. Uh, Will Lewis, who was um, uh, who previously held a similar position at uh, Bank of America, uh, we uh, we at Notel uh, have taken these uh, topics quite seriously and um, have been active in terms of uh, forcing this uh, these incredibly important conversations within the organization and uh, more uh, more broadly. Um, and namely, these conversations about uh, social and uh, racial justice. Uh, I'd be curious at what data uh, Experian has on uh, racial and gender and maybe other social dynamics uh, within the broader consumer market. And um, if you're able to apply that and what, what you're doing and, uh, in, this, in this area and whether you're able to 
apply any of these uh, uh, in, any of these insights to help bend the arc of moral justice in the right direction? Well, Edward, this is a great question, and it's certainly relevant for for this time and and as long as credit has been available. You know, we really look at diversity and, and inclusion as a a big part of what we do. Um, you know, there are, are rules around it too. When we look at our ECOA and we talk about what is allowed to be used in credit decisioning and what's not, and of course, it's all race, religion. Um, any type of demographic information that's included. We just cut it right out. It's not part of what we do. And that's all covered under the eligibility of like the Fair Credit Reporting Act as well. So what we're, what we're doing as a business where we're using um, the data that we have to uh, create inclusion, uh, to create a value for those that may be underserved or not participating uh, in the financial market, just as typical um, U.S. consumers uh, have done over the years, uh, we've, uh, you know, it's really in our DNA to do this, to help these. I mean, our our goal here is to support, you know, in my business and commercial data science is to support and lift up small businesses and all the work that we do. And that includes the guarantor, that consumer. So one of the, a great example of something that we're doing very tactically is Experian Boost. And it really allows a consumer to bring in non-traditional uh, endpoints into their evaluation uh, when they're going out and trying to get credit or looking for affordable funding. And what it does is brings in uh, real-time utility and rental information, so things that you would already be paying. You can bring in and report those into the Bureau and it becomes a trade on your file, trade line, and so that that can be scored. And that's like you talked about, a FICO or Vantage score, any types of these generic credit scores can evaluate you. Um, Boost has really helped you know, millions of Americans at this point, and it's really a great tool. And you can go out there and boost your score and see what it is immediately. Um, just a way to get those that um, haven't participated before uh, included. Now, you talked about will to uh, as part of our um, really chief of diversity as we come into, uh, you know, continuing to expand what we do here at Experian. And, and know that we've, you know, we've, we've been uh, high on the list of Fortune 100's best places to work. We're part of the... Uh, in the human rights correlation or coalition's best workplaces for LBDT, LBTTQ, um, we really have been part of um, a lot of different programs that are out there in the market. Um, you know, I was listening to the NCUA um, discussion. They were talking about an access program. Uh, we're part of one that works with that group as well. Uh, we just uh, put together a partnership with Operation Hope really helps people of color who are struggling uh, to understand or get their score credit scores up. It helps them to look at credit and evaluate behaviors and look for ways to really get in and get those, um, get people in a place where they really feel like they're just not surviving anymore. They're really thriving. And, a, and a, you know, in the U.S., a credit score is a big part of um, that access to credit and that access to affordable um, cash and just feeling like you have that opportunity in front of you. And so part of what we do at Experian and part of the things that I've done is, is become, we volunteer our time to be amb ambassadors to our community. And we go out and teach people how to use credit and what are some of the things that they need to do. For a small business owner, you, you want to know that you need to separate your consumer credit from your commercial credit. It makes both scores go up and you have accessibility to both types. So in doing this interaction with the community, we can really help those that are underserved and really having a tough time to get them in a place where they really feel like they're not going from, you know, this week to next and worried about if they're gonna have that cushion. That we teach them how to thrive and teach them you know, behaviors that will set them in a place where they can really get access to this, uh, 
to affordable funding. And that's really where we want to go with this. And as we go forward, you'll see us interacting more. Will is just going to help us to focus. I mean, we feel like we're doing pretty good, but you know you can always do better. So we look for the opportunity to work with him and just get better. Yeah, Brody, that's, uh, that's amazing. It's a, a much better answer than I expected. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I, uh, I certainly, um, I, I think what, what Experian uh, can do and is doing uh, is, uh, is a great example of what uh, every company should be doing. I mean, we know that uh, uh, from biology, we know that diversity is a driver of uh, evolution. And um, we, we know that diverse teams uh, and diverse environments operate better. And uh, I hope that uh, this is something that uh, helps us uh, uh, recover faster. And uh, I certainly see uh, Experian uh, being a significant uh, part or a significant driver uh, of this change and uh, maybe even the economic recovery. I, I wanted to thank you for uh, taking the time. Uh, we have run out. I want to be cognizant of the time uh, that uh, uh, the audience has allocated to our conversation. And um, wanted to thank you for, uh, for being here. Wanted to um, thank everyone for tuning in. And um, um, I guess um, until we have another one of these uh, wonderful sessions. Sounds thank great. You. Thank you, Edward. Thank you, Brody.